Oh, it's so good to see y'all tonight. As we begin to worship, let me ask you to do a couple of things for me. Let me ask you to um, just really press into the Lord tonight. We're going to start with a kind of a, a older hymn and called How Deep Is the Father's Love for Us. And let, let's ask our minds to cast towards that, to the Calvary, and see what he's, and press in on what he's done for us. Let's lift our voice, let's stand to our feet, and let's sing. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his dream. here tonight. I'm glad you're able to come back on Saturday night. Brother Todd said when we talk to the internet peoples, you know, kind of, I don't know, I guess I'm going to go ahead and do it. You know, Brother Todd sometimes he kind of, for all you people in internet land, he said, look at this camera. So I'm looking. Last week we had everybody who was here spread way out, move up. So if no, you don't have to do it tonight, but if you are at home watching this and you know you could move up here next week, and you're just saying it's just easier it's, we're not here to follow the Lord easy. We're here to follow the Lord together. So if you're far away in the internet land, you can't make it here. That's one thing. But we would encourage you next week, move on in here with us and let's worship together. For those of us that are here, again, I am very excited. I'm very pumped up today. I've been at a 10 uh, all day long. And so uh, Coach Cleveland's here tonight. And at 10, 11 o'clock, we were working this morning. He said, hey, Coach, what are you preaching on? And as soon as I started thinking about tonight's sermon, I couldn't think about football anymore. And uh, I am excited that we're here together to open God's Word. With that, uh, Brother David made a mention to uh, encourage you, if you are our guest, uh, and this is your first or second time here, we would love to have a record of your visit so we can pray for you. Um, we're not going to spam you with calls and emails, but we do want to pray for you. And there is a card in the back of your chair that you can fill out. Now on Sunday, Brother Todd called out Brother Cotton back here and he said, you've been here for two weeks in a row? And he said, yeah. And he said, you're part of the family now. And so for those of us who've been here two or three weeks in a row and you feel in your heart that God has you to be a part of our family here at Victory, then fill out that form and say, I'd like to to join and you say how do I join first thing is if you get saved amen, amen. 
Mimi's excited. Amen. If you get saved, you say, what's that mean? We're going to talk about it in a minute, but it basically comes to the point of when we recognize that in our sin, we are separated from Almighty God, but He died on the cross for us. When we ask Him to be our Lord and Savior, He forgives us of our sin. He saves us, saves our soul, and He brings us into the family. And if you do that tonight, you can join this church. And for those of you who say, well, I've already been saved, and I know I've been baptized, then you just put a statement, I believed in Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. And you come on into the family here. Um, so, Brother David said, you've been here two or three weeks? What are you waiting on? You've been watching on Internet Land, as Brother Todd would say, for two or three weeks? What are you waiting on? Send us an email and get involved and get connected with what we're doing. With that, I am looking forward to what God's going to do tonight. So let's pray and ask Him for His blessing in it. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We are excited to be in your presence. We are excited to be back here together. Lord, thank you for those that are here in person. Lord, those that are watching online. Lord, I pray that together, all of us in our souls, you said in your word that if we're saved, we are already seated together in heavenly places. And you said where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you would be also. So where we are tonight, Lord, we ask that you would be with us. We ask that you would open our hearts. Lord, if you need to cleanse us from our sin, we ask you to cleanse us. If you need to cut away unrighteousness, we ask you to cut away. Lord, if you want to lift us up, Lord, we pray you would lift us up on your wings. Lord, we ask that wherever we are, we would meet with you honestly, and each one of us would leave different than when we came in. Lord, that you would speak to each one of us in the point of our need, and you would move us into the, the place of your calling and your will for our lives. And we ask that you would do that now as we worship you, Lord, and in a minute as we open your word, if you give us that time. In Jesus' name, amen.
praise. Amen. Let's keep worshiping our God together.
Mason, you come, brother. You mean? Yeah, yeah. You guys can have a seat. After last week, some people that watched the service, the service, the worship, and the preaching online, they said, hey, you really, y'all really got excited in there. And uh, I said, yeah. And um, they said, are you always like that? And I said, pretty much. Um, the coaching staff says Coach Peavy likes to live at an eight. Uh, Coach Hill tells me, you're at a 10, I need you at a 2. Uh, stay pretty amped up all the time. But uh, in here, we got something to be excited about. So why are they singing that song, May His Favor Be Upon You? In, your, in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming and you're going, why, that just song repeats itself over and over. Well, in all honesty, uh, I need the favor of the Lord. I got something to be excited about that He's going to do that because I'm trusting in God for a lot bigger things than something to do on Saturday night in here. I'm trusting God for a lot bigger things than to make me feel morally superior to people who don't go to church or some nonsense like that. I'm not here for temporary things. I'm, I'm trusting the Lord and He's given me His favor because uh, I'm a sinner and uh, God is holy and I was separated from Him and I'm trusting Him for my eternity. Without Him, I have no hope. I'm trusting that the Lord is who he says he is and that when Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from the grave, God raised him from the grave and he now sits eternally at the right hand of the Father on high. And because he sits conquered over death, I can join him there because he paid for my sin. I'm trusting God for that kind of favor. So when we sing the song, it's something to get excited about. It's not just in here saying words to the air and it's a nice little beat that Lamwell hits on the drums. It's... What are we really trusting God for? What kind of favor are we asking for? Are we asking just so we can uh, feel good and get a little money in our pocket and, and live a little better because we're not out getting drunk on Saturday night? No, I'm asking God for eternal things. I'm asking for favor on my family. Gee, the Word of God says if you raise your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that when they're old, it will not depart from them. My son's three, but when he's 63, I want him to follow the Lord. You know, uh, I probably w won't be alive to see it, but I want him to walk steadfastly. I'm trusting God for my family. It says in that song, to a thousand generations. Mamaw's mama, Granny Cochran, I never met her. She pushed me with the First Baptist Church of Rosser when she was Mamaw's age, 90. And she begged them not to hire anybody else to do it or let anybody else do it when they were saying, we'll pay someone, some young guy to mow this yard so Ms. Cochran can stop. And she begged them, don't take away the last thing I can do for my God. She was trusting God for favor on her daughter. Who trusted God for favor on her daughter? who trusted God for favor on her son, Brother Todd, who trusted favor on it for me. And now we're six, seven generations into this deal. I'm looking for a thousand generations. I'm tired of coming, trusting God for things that are too little, for what I need to be trusting him for. He's got big things for us to do. He's got big things for the world to see. You say, how do you know? Because they want the world to see him. He's the biggest thing there is. He's big enough that he holds all creation in his hand. He's small enough that he lives inside my soul. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll open the door, I'll enter in with you and I'll sup with you. Sup means basically, we, we get the word supper, right? But it really means, well, I'm going to eat out of the same bowl. We're going to be that close. When we do Passover in here, we, uh, on Easter, we eat a Passover meal. We talk about the Lord as the Passover lamb. And everybody shares a bowl. And I don't know if we'll let us do it over COVID. But pick who you want to sit by because you can be dipping out of the same bowl. And the Lord said, I'll come in and do that with you. Man, I need the favor of God on my life. If you guys can't see that we need the favor of God on our country and our world, then I guess you're blind. 
David said a few weeks ago, we looked at it, he said, No, in the goodness of God's house, I, we, I hope for your, your good, for your well-being. We call a God down, we ask him like James and John, can we call fire down on the lost world? He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. We want these people saved. They need the favor of God. The person you hate at work needs the favor of God. Jesus, the Bible says, if you hate your brother without cause, we can't live like that. We can't look at the world and say it's going to hell and be happy about it. We, they need the favor of God, just like we did. And we were saved, but I need the favor of God. And you say, man, what do you keep on? Is, that, is this the sermon? No, this is just because what we were singing to the Lord in that song. Guys, it's serious. We've got to come in here and worship with our hearts because we need it. Anyway, I told you all at the welcome that I've been fired up all day, and I pray that for your sake I'll preach short. Um... But last week, we looked at a pretty uh, strong passage in the Word of God where Paul basically says that for the ministry that we've been given to bring the word of reconciliation to the world, he said, I will not do anything that brings blame to the ministry, to the call of God into people's lives. So he said, I'm going to live different. And we read about the seriousness of what he meant. And all week I've been thinking about that to the point, maybe I almost just preached the same sermon again as the same passage because I felt like God was telling me, Mason, you preached that sermon, but did you really get it this week? And I looked at my life and there were several places where I did not live up to the idea that God had put in my heart and the truth that he had told me to grab a hold of in my heart to follow him the way Paul was writing last week to the Corinthians that we should follow him. And I found myself compromised and falling short in a lot of places. And I said, oh my God, I guess I need the same sermon again, Lord, because I don't know what to do. And God said, you got to reach out and you got to grab a hold of what I've already laid hold of for you. And so tonight I want to open your Bibles with, or open your Bibles with me and bro draw your attention to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 12, but there is some things that I want to mention before we get into this. In Philippians 3, and I'm not usually a Greek scholar by any means. So did you go to seminary and take Greek? No, I didn't, but I have the internet, and uh, you can Google ancient Greek, right? And uh, when I studied this passage, one of the things that God grabbed a hold of me, he says, I want you to look at how serious I'm talking to you here. This isn't just something you read and skim through. And one of the things that God brought my attention to is in the original language, in this passage, Philippians 12 through 15, that we're going to look at here in just a second, Paul uses the most aggressive forms of, for the verbs and the words that he's using in the ancient Greek. So when he's talking and he says, lay a hold, he uses the most aggressive form of grabbing a hold of something that you can use. When he says, reaching forward, he uses the most aggressive form of the word reaching that you can use. And so when Paul wrote this, a lot of times in my heart when I read the Bible, I almost read it like I'm reading a regular book. Like when David said, oh God, you are my God, early will I seek thee. You know, that sometimes is how I read that. But when David wrote that, David said, I was in a spiritual desert. He said, oh God, you are my God, early will I seek thee. He said, as a man who's in a dry and weary land. He said, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you, like a man who's in a dry and weary land where no water is. Now David had been a man in the literal desert, dying of thirst and needed the Lord to give him real water, right, physical water. He also knew what it meant to be a man dying of thirst in his soul. On Wednesday night, we looked at a passage of Scripture where the Bible talks to the young people. We were talking to the young people about how the world will literally starve you to death. Maybe you don't starve physically, but Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you starve spiritually, and you're, when you starve, you die. And if your marriage starves, it dies. And if your relationship with your children and your family starves, it dies. And the way that we are fed is not having money to go on vacations, and it's not uh, going and, and, and skipping church because when we, you know, all these things we say, well, I'm going to go do this for my, but how we really grow our family is to grab in from the Lord and be full and pour it out into them. And so we looked at that, how the world will starve you out, and God has drawn us to him. And I just had a, a look at Stubbs. I had a long rabbit hole I was about to go down. 
And God said, you prayed and asked to preach quickly. So I'm going to try to get back on what Paul's saying here. He's, he's using the most aggressive forms of the words. So when I read this, I can't read it like I do a lot of times. David's soul was pouring out before God there in Psalms. And right here, Paul is giving maybe the most impassioned plea to Christians that he could give. And when we read through Philippians, we say, hey, I want to read Philippians because it's only four chapters. And we read through it real fast. But Paul, when he wrote this, in this passage of Scripture particularly, he is begging, he is imploring. Through the words he chose to use, he's given the most impassioned speech that he could give the Philippians. And so when we read it tonight, I want you to, in your mind or in your heart, listen to the words of the Lord. He is impassionately pleading with us to be serious about what we're doing. Last week we came in here and I felt like maybe we had the best week that we have had. But through the week this week, I feel like we might have had the most complacency that we've had. And God didn't call us to that. On Sunday morning, if you got to watch the uh, sermon or you were here, Brother Todd asked the whole church to spend one hour on Sunday at some point studying the verse that he preached on and asking God, what is this for me? And I don't know everybody's heart. But just through my prayer and my time with the Lord, how many of us, Victory, really did that? Did we go home and get in the Word for one hour over one verse and say, God, what do you have for me? And not close it up in five minutes and say, got it. If we didn't, then we're complacent. And kind of like we mentioned in the welcome, for those of you in Internet land, the lack of amens, I don't know if we did it and we're like, hey, yeah, tell them, or we didn't and we're like, oh, me, I'll keep my mouth closed. But if we're complacent, then we got to move past it. We came in here, I can't preach harder than I did last week or I'll probably have a stroke. I told the youth this because we had a great Wednesday last week too. But I told them, I can't live your Christianity for you in a state of emotional preaching. It can be used as a kickstart, but then you got to go run your race. We're a church. We're the body of Christ. We're running a relay race together. we got to push the baton around the track. But I can't run your leg, and you can't run mine. And so when we read about Paul saying, I want to be unknown but yet well-known, crushed and killed, but yet I live in Christ, he said, we're going to live it like that. But when we got out on Sunday, when we got out on Monday, when we lived last week, you couldn't live in passionately following Christ for me, and I can't do it for you. And when I looked at myself a few days ago and I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? Lord, what do I need to know? And he said, did you really do the sermon from last week, Mason? And I opened my Bible to Corinthians, and I started marking down notes of where I hadn't lived up to the emotion that we preached with and we had last week on Saturday. And I said, God, what do I do? He said, you've got to start grabbing a hold of what I have already grabbed for you. And you say, what does that mean? Look here in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul is talking about the uh, resurrection in Christ. In verse 10, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I will follow Christ. I want to know him even in the suffering. I want to know him even in his physical death because in the physical death of Christ, spiritually we can live. And so he's talking about that and he says this, not that I have already attained. What I know about my self-reflection this week is I have definitely not attained. Victory, what I would say about the way we probably went out as a church this week, and you say, are you judging me? No, I'm just telling you what God's pressed me in my spirit to say. We probably recognize, hopefully we recognize, we're not so self-righteous that we don't see that we have not attained. So Paul said, I know I haven't attained or am already perfected, but I press on, listen, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Now remember, when he said lay hold, what, he, what a better maybe translation could say, and some of them do, is that I may make my own. I've laid a hold of it to the point that it is mine. Your salvation is yours. Grab a hold of it. 
My salvation is mine. I got to grab a hold of it and hold it close. My marriage is my marriage. I wear this ring on my body every day. And my marriage is supposed to show a picture of Christ in the church. I got to wear my salvation on me, in my hands, every day. You would have to kill me to take this ring from me. Somebody busting here right now goes to rob us, give me your wedding ring. You better kill me. And if we're live like that for a, a, a token of our marriage to one another, what would we do for our salvation? We got to live in it. We got to lay hold of it. And the reason we may not have lived up to what we wanted to last week or lived with the same fire and the same passion that we come in here and worship together with is because have we really laid a hold? Have we made it our own? You say you want your own word? No, it's the Lord's word. But my salvation is mine, and I have to grab it. And God said, the reason you didn't live up to what you preached, the reason you didn't follow everything in your heart out with your flesh and with your mind and with your life this week is because you, Mason, have not fully, really made it your own. I have already made it, your, made it you for you, he says here, that I may lay hold of what Christ Jesus has already laid hold of for me. I am, the Bible says, who Christ says I am. But I don't always live that. And the reason I don't is because there's a disconnect between what Jesus has grabbed a hold of for me and where I've met him in it. And I started thinking about, Lord, how do I do that? And I thought of a few things. If you want to make something your own, you got to claim it. And I thought about Joshua, I mean, it's Joshua and Caleb. In the Old Testament, there was two spies out of the 12 that went into the promised land. And the Ten spies came back, and they told them, told the people, they told Moses, there's giants in the land, there's fortified cities in the land, we'll be like ants to them, like grasshoppers to them, they'll destroy us, we can't do it. And two men, they rose up, and they said, you're right, there are giants in the land, there are fortified cities, there are great enemies. Brother Todd preached a sermon on Sunday, he said, there is a great open door to us, it's great and it's effectual, but there are many adversaries, and they acknowledged that. But Joshua and Caleb said, but we are well able to go up and take it in the Lord. And at that time, Caleb was 40 years old. And Moses told him that the Lord would give him a mountain that he had spied out as his inheritance. And 40 years later, because the children would not follow the Lord and they wanted to follow those 10 guys who couldn't trust God, which is typically what happens in, when you put things to a vote, the minority will follow the Lord and the majority will overrule them. Let's live in the minority. Let's live in the remnant. Let's live in the 10% of the Lord. And that's another sermon for another day. Preach you fast. But guys, Joshua and Caleb, they said we're well able in the Lord to go up and take it. Forty years later, when God moved them under Joshua's leadership into the promised land and they began to conquer the land, Caleb was now 80 years old. And when they had conquered everyone else's inheritance, he went up to Joshua and he said, you were there in the presence of the Lord when Moses said that that is my inheritance. And he said, I'm as able now as I was back then he said, give me my mountain. I will go kill the giants on it. I will go tear down the strongholds of the pagan, and I will build God's way, God's salvation for me. I will grab a hold of it. It's mine. They can't have it. You can't have it. Nobody can touch it. God has given it to me. And when my flesh starts calling out to sin and trying to pull me away from what God has laid a hold of for me, what I got to look in the mirror and say is, Mason, you can't touch it. And when the world tries to pull us away, what we got to say is, I have claimed what Jesus has claimed for me, and you can't have it. The Lord said, if I will raise my son in the way he should go, that when he was old, he will follow the Lord. I don't know what he'll do at 15. I don't know what he'll do at 25. I don't know what he'll do in his 30s, but this is what I know. God has gave me a promise, and I'm going to grab a hold of it. Now i got to live it, and I can't let it fall out of my hands, and I can't turn in sin. And when he's 15, he's got a hypocrite for a daddy that used to be a preacher. But I'm going to take it 
because God's given it. You say, you're preaching, name it, claim it. No, I'm not. The Lord never said I'd be rich. The Lord never said I'd be healthy. The Lord never said I'd have it easy. But he did say we can raise our children under his nurture and his admonition. It's not me. That's his child. That's his promise. We read last week about all the hard things Christians are going to go through. There's no name it, claim it gospel. That's a nonsense. But if the Lord has told you, you're not just calling it out of the air. It's mine. I laid claim of it. Joshua, Caleb, they laid claim of the inheritance that God had given them. And if you want to grab a hold of something and make it your own, you got to claim it. I'm going to have a stroke. If you're going to make something your own, you're going to have to sacrifice for it. Mark 10, 45, Jesus, the word says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life ransom for the many. If we're going to live a hold of what God's laid a hold of for us, then we're going to have to sacrifice the way he sacrificed for us. He gave up himself on the cross. He could have been the, the, the master of all. He is the master of all. He could have walked down on the, on the, on, uh, in Bethlehem as a great conqueror and crushed all the sinners under his feet. But he came in a cradle in the dirt like we sang, and he lived sinless, and he let them crucify him on the cross so that he could raise from, rise from the grave and give us life. And he sacrificed all that there was for all that I am, which is not much. But what I am is created in his image. What I am is his child. What I am is someone who he loves. That's what I love about the book of John. You know, John never called himself John. He said the one that Jesus loved. He understood that God gave everything for me because he loved me. And if I'm going to lay hold of what he has for me, I'm going to have to sacrifice. I'm going to have to lay it down. What I love about the apostle Paul, he told the, uh, Timothy, his young brother in the faith, Timothy was probably led to the Lord by Paul. He was definitely anointed as a pastor by Paul, and he went around preaching but he was younger in the faith. And Paul didn't pull no punches. He told Timothy, I am already being poured out as a drink offering before the Lord. He said, and my departure is at hand. He knew he was going to go die for the faith. And he said, I'm being poured out right now before my God as an offering, as a sacrifice. In the same way, in a lesser way, but in the same way that he poured himself out for me, church, are we going to sacrifice to lay hold of what God has laid hold of for us? We are supposed to see and do things in the power of the Spirit that are greater even than Jesus feeding the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. He said, you will do greater things than these, but I haven't laid hold of that spiritual power even to overcome the feebleness of my mind and the temptation of my flesh to see anything like that happen because have I sacrificed enough to lay hold of it? Could I really say that showing up to church on Saturday night and Sunday morning at 9 and Sunday at 10.30 is a real sacrifice in the way that I'm pouring myself out before God? Sometimes we act like coming to church once extra a week is some huge thing we do for God. What would it be if we let God pour us out? Shane and, sing, Shane, and sing, Shane and Shane sing a song and they say, burn us up. Burn us up. They're, they're singing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And they say, burn us up, O king. Would we let our bodies go to the grave to be poured out for the Lord? Would we let our bank accounts be poured out for the Lord. Someone watching the internet said, see, I knew you crazy preachers. Y'all preach so hard and then you want people to give you money. I don't care if you send one dollar to this church ever. But would you give it to somebody who's starving that you see in Dallas on the side of the street? And you say, well, they're probably using to buy beer. Who cares? Jesus said, if you've given to the least of these, you've given to me. He said, especially you Christians, you want, to be, you want to be a Christian? He said, you saw me and I was naked and you wouldn't clothe me and I was hungry and you wouldn't feed me. And they say, Lord, when did we see you? And he said, if you won't do it for the least of these, you won't do it for me. Would we pour out our bank accounts? 
Would we pour out our vacation funds? Would we give seven nights a week? You say, you're just trying to get me to come to more church. I'm not trying to get y'all to do anything. I'm, I'm trying to talk to myself. Would I pour out myself for the Lord and not be resentful of the fact that there is no free nights in the week? I'm glad that the Lord didn't take that with me. Can't come on to the cross on Friday, Mason. I'm busy. I got stuff to do football season, you know. We got to pour ourselves out. We got to sacrifice to lay hold of what God's given us. The reason we may not lived up to what we preached and what we believed last week, you know, James said, you say you have faith, I'll show you my faith by what I do. The reason maybe our faith last week in here didn't move to action is because have we really laid hold of, are we really willing to sacrifice what is necessary to grab a hold of what Jesus has for us? Some smaller things to sacrifice. Maybe we got to stop watching the F-bombs on the TV set all the time. Maybe we got to stop watching the shows that the world calls awesome that, that degrade God's way. If you have to throw the TV set out the window, throw it out the window. And then don't go buy another one at Walmart when you feel sad about it tomorrow. I want to move past Brother David having to sacrifice, feel like I'm sacrificing things that are worthless. I want to move into real sacrifice. I want to have the faith to move into real sacrifice. Not just what would I give up of things already worthless, but what would I give of myself to be poured out before the Lord because that's, a, that's something that lets me lay hold of what Jesus has laid hold of for me. And at the end of the day, guys, we got to move past even of what that means for us because Paul said, and my departure is at hand, and he already knew he was going to go to Rome and be killed. It's so that Jesus can get glory in our lives. I can't give him glory in my life if I won't lay a hold of what he's already got for me. Because that's what his will is for me. And if I don't follow his will, how will I glorify my king? You have to be dedicated. You have to have some devotion before God. There has to be consistency in our walk. Jesus said in Luke, a man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one, he'll hate the other. He said you can't serve God and mammon. Sometimes it's trans translated money. You can't serve God and money, but really it's God and things. Are we more dedicated to our things than we are to our king? We have to get some consistency, some devotion. I stood right here on this exact spot and devoted my life to my wife. That's an everyday thing. You don't get to wake up tomorrow and say, nope. Right? I asked Jesus when he saved me to be the Lord and Savior of my life. He's my Savior every day. I have to follow him as Lord every day. It's devotion. It's dedication. The things that we make our own, we are dedicated to. Coach is in here tonight. I work for Coach Cleveland at Scurry. Now, I wasn't going to, I didn't plan on this, but I didn't know you was coming. It means a lot that I got to go and study tonight to, during the day. I got a man that I can work for that, hey man, you got to carry the word tonight. Get your film done, and we'll see you. But we preach to them kids in the locker room about you got to be dedicated to your team. You got to be dedicated to show up early and stay late. You got to do all the reps. You can't skip a rep. And we get pretty fired up about it. And I would be a hypocrite if I would be more fired up at a 16 year old to come to 630 weights than I would be for my own self to be dedicated before my master and king who died on the cross for me. We got to start living with the same intensity we scream at the TV set when millionaires are fighting over a round ball. Where is our real dedication? And in all reality, I love my wife. I talk about her all the time. The kids think I'm the most sappiest guy in the world at youth. But I got to be more dedicated to God than I am to her so that I can actually honor her and glorify God. A lot of time, you know, in the Lord, when he says uh, six things I despise, yea, seven I hate, and, you know, one of them is sloth. You know, I'm a slothful man by nature. I can't be more dedicated to my rest and my leisure and my relaxation and my feel good than I am to God. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you're sleepy. Sometimes you're tired. 
I don't know how tired and sleepy Jesus was when he didn't eat for 40 days so that he could be tempted by Satan himself. But he did it for me. Where's my dedication? Where's my devotion? We don't use words like that very much in America anymore. I have to be loyal. I have to give allegiance. I give allegiance to what I've grabbed a hold of. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua told the people, and I'm going to move on. I know, I don't know about the internet land, but everybody in here, I know you're getting it. He said, if you want to go back and live the old life under the false gods of Egypt where you've been, go back. He said, and if you want to turn to the new sin and follow the, God, the false gods of the Canaanites, then go there. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If I want to lay a hold and make my own what God has laid a hold of for me and really live it, my loyalty, my allegiance has to rest in Him and Him alone. If the world wants to follow Satan and go to hell, they can go. If the world wants to follow the flesh and go to hell, they can go. The Bible says at the end of the day, let he who is righteous be righteous still, and he who is unrighteous be unrighteous still. And you say, you don't care if lost people get saved? Of course I care. That's why we're here. But at the end of the day, my allegiance is with God. My allegiance is with Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he created me, and he breathed life into me, and he died on the cross for me, and he rose, on the, rose from the grave for me. And when I was six years old, he started calling me, and he saved me from my sin. And he has led me for the last 33 years. And he will lead me for the next 33 years if he gives them to me on this earth. And he will lead me for eternity to come because he is my God and he is my king and I have no loyalty or allegiance to any other. And Joshua said, if you want to follow the world, you want to follow the devil, that's up to you. But church, would we say, not just write it, we all got it stenciled on our house somewhere. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We got it somewhere. I guarantee you, most, 90, nine out of ten houses in this room have that on their house somewhere. Would we move past of claiming it on our walls and claiming it on our heart, on our hands, on our head? Who are we really? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That means when I'm having a conversation with someone I don't like, that means when I get mad and I want to drop an F-bomb in my front of my kids, that means when I see someone who needs help and I'm moved in compassion for them the way the Lord's moved in compassion for me, we serve him in every action we take, in every thought we act on, in everything we do. It's not a, well, I go to church every week and I pay my tithes and so I'm following the Lord. It's an everyday confession. As for me, I will serve the Lord. In second period, every day at the school, we say the American Pledge of Allegiance, we say the Texas Pledge of Allegiance, and we have a moment of silence. What would it be if the church stopped being silent all the time and we let everybody know our true pledge was before God alone? Our real confession is lived out every day. Our real Pledge of Allegiance is lived out every day, or it's not. And so if I want to lay hold of what God has laid hold of for me, the words I thought of earlier is I got to be, I got to claim it, I got to sacrifice for it, I got to be dedicated to it, and I got to be loyal to him above all else. And then look what Paul says. Verse 13, brethren, brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Here's the thing. You say, preacher, it's easy. You come up here, you holler at us. Some people think I'm hollering at us, right? I'm just excited. I don't understand why God would want to use me, but I'm excited he talks to me. There's a million other people he could call up here and do a better job than me. But Paul said, woe unto me unless I preach the gospel. I can't stop because he's been so good to me. I don't know why he talks to me, and I am excited. And I'm not trying to holler and gripe because I'm a worthless sinner too, like everybody. 
I'm the worst one in this room. I'm not trying to come in here and get on everybody's case. It's us together following the Lord. We're the body of Christ. I haven't apprehended this. I don't understand all what God's laid a hold of for me. I definitely fail every day in grabbing a hold of it. But we all in here are honest enough to say we all are in the same boat. And let's press on, right? So Paul says, I'm not trying to act like I got it figured out. But one thing I do is forgetting those things which are behind. We've got to move past what we left behind. That's why Joshua said, if you want to go back to the land of uh, Egypt, go back. But I won't go back to bondage. I'm following the Lord. He's made me free. I'm free from sin. I won't go back. We've got to forget what's behind. All of us, we have, a, we have a temptation to when we talk about old times when we was lost or backslidden, we laugh and cut up and all the stupid stuff that we should have probably died, ran off the road and died from, that God gave us grace to live, us live through. We laugh and, and yuck that up. But we don't talk the same excitement about the Lord. So, woo, when I was 17, we jumped truck to truck driving down 34. Woo! I don't know if many of them knew we did that. And if you're watching this, high school student, don't do that. And we'll laugh and we'll carry on about all the stupid things we did. But will we laugh and get excited about the Lord and what he's done? Got to forget behind. Some of us have been in the church a long time. I keep looking at Mimi. It's my grandma. I don't know more faithful witness that I've ever had in my whole life of someone who just follows the Lord no matter what. But Mimi knows, and if you don't, I'll tell you. We've got to forget all the things we've done in the past, even if they were good. We've got to keep going. Forgetting what's behind doesn't just mean forgetting the past sin. It means forgetting, I taught Sunday school for 40 years. I'm glad Miss Nancy Upchurch, who taught me, didn't say, well, 40 years and I'm good. Because she'd have been about 45, 50 years by the time she got me. But she sure did teach me about Joseph in the coat of many colors on a flannel graph board, and I can see it right now. Forgetting what's behind, even past blessings. The old preacher in Rosser, my dad always quotes him, and I remember this my whole life. He says, leave me and he prays, say, Lord, we're thankful for past blessings, but they are not sufficient for this hour. And wasn't saying God wasn't sufficient. He was reminding himself in prayer. I can't live on the past blessings. I've got to even forget those things. You know, talking about coaches, you know, worst thing, I mean, I'm terrible at it. The worst thing about a coach, you can't talk about all the stuff you used to do because you, you, it's over now. It's someone else's turn, right? But guys, our turn ain't over. We're still following the Lord. We got to forget even the good and press on. He says, I, this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind and reaching forward. Remember, that's the strongest form. It's really straining forward. Reaching is a, is a watered-down English word for what the Greek is trying to say. He says, I'm straining forward. I've forgotten what's behind me, and I'm fighting with everything that's in me to move. And what am I moving to? I'm straining forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus. He said, I'm not just reaching like we would think I reach for the doorknob. He said, I'm straining. If you want to get in this, you look this up at your house, you think I'm lying, you go find the Greek, you read about it. He uses, it's this, verse, this verb for restraining is used only one place in the whole Bible, right here in this verse. He said, I'm, I'm forgetting what's behind, and with everything I can, I am straining to get to where God wants me to go. When the temptation comes into my mind, how many times have I strained with every fiber of my being to resist the devil, he says, and move ahead with God? I would say I have strained very little. I have thought about it. Well, God, I know that's wrong. Ah, okay. God, I really tried to strain there. I was thinking about a kid that I used to teach in powerlifting or coach in powerlifting. He wasn't very strong. He really wasn't a powerlifter, but he liked to work hard. 
in his senior year, he was setting a personal record for himself on deadlift at the meet. He was no chance of getting a medal. No chance of finishing anywhere but maybe next to last. But he did not go to the power to meet. He went to the power to meet to, to push himself. And he got on this deadlift. And he had never lifted it before. And when he budged off the ground, it barely moved. And in a deadlift competition, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> everybody's like, ah, crazy Coach Peavy. If the bar stops moving up, it's a no lift. It cannot freeze or go down. But you can lift it up as slow as you want. And he grabbed that weight and he pulled it. And you could see in his face, because I was screaming in it, he thought, I don't know if I got this. And he strength. And he pulled there for probably one minute. And the judge is looking at him. And when he locked that bar out, his face, he blacked both his eyes from busting blood vessels. And he strained. And when he got that, that judge said down, and everybody in that whole arena went nuts. And I think he got eighth out of tenth. The next year when I came back, that, the judge said, hey, do you have that kid who pulled the hardest deadlift I've ever seen in my whole life? That boy ain't got no quit in him. I said, no, he graduated. I wished he was back. Because I like somebody who will get in and strain for a while. How often has my sin... I wanted it gone, and I went over there, mm -mm, too heavy, I'll just leave it. And God said, why don't you grab a hold of that and strain down until I get it in your hands and you can throw it off. Brother Todd talked about bookending the first century church, and he mentioned some men that were killed for the faith, some women. Even beyond them. Jesus looked down and he saw Stephen being martyred, being stoned. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Stephen strained so hard in his life. He fought so hard against the world and so hard against sin. And he preached with all that he had in his life. The Bible says he wasn't just a preacher. He said he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he strained so hard that the Lord stood up and said, That's what I'm talking about, boy! Pull! Paul said, I'm pouring myself out before God, and if it takes every last drop I got, I'm going to get to where he has me to go. Man, I want Jesus to call Gabriel and say, Gabriel, come here. Look down there in the scurry, and there is a dumb, crazy, crying football coach. And but look at him strain. He can't reach it without me, but I'm going to give him the strength. I just want him to hold on for a while. He's going to live the right life in front of his wife and in front of his kids and in front of the kids at school. He's going to walk strong in the North 40 and wherever he goes in life. He ain't backing up. Look at him hold. God forbid. If I live long enough, I'm going to bury these mountains of faith that God's shown me. And I'm going to stand up here and I'm preach the funeral. You say, I think, oh, the Todd will do it. Now, I'm going to cut him off. And I'm going to be in grief. But yet not overwhelmed. Because we're going to strain through with the Lord. And if God forbid, I know Mimi would say, if I go first, man, Mimi, strain through. I know it'll be sad. But oh, how happy will that day be? We got to pull through when it's hard. It's going to be hard. There's lives at stake. I asked God for forgiveness today because I was so excited and I was saying, I hope the church understands that it's urgent. And he said, Mason, what you have missed, it's just been urgent this whole time. There's a brother over here who's been straining for 40 years in ministry. He's taught me more than anybody I know. It's urgent, Victory. You say, I'm well past my days. There's a 93-year-old woman sitting in here with like 10 great-great-grandchildren. And she's holding on, and she's telling them, even in your weakest times, give honor to God. He'll walk you through. 
Man, I want to pool a while with the Lord. I hope he don't take me home early. If it's his will, it's his will, Mimi. But if he gives me 50 years to pool, I don't want to let up for one second. I can't get distracted by the world and let go of what God's given me. Jesus said in Luke, if you grab a hold of my plow, he said anyone who looks back is not worthy of me. None of us are worthy. He makes us worthy. But man, let's hold on to the plow. I'm from Rosser. It's sand. You can dig a 20-foot hole in like two hours. It's easy digging. Now I live in Scurry. It's like black clay. You have to fill the hole full of water to get two inches out with the post hole digger. If we're plowing through sand, amen. But when we hit some clay, let's hold on to the plow. If our hands start to bleed, amen. Paul said, I bear the marks of the gospel in my flesh. And he wasn't talking about the cross tattoo. He was talking about broken bones and busted heads from rocks and Roman soldiers' clubs. And the devil's best hit men couldn't touch him. He held and he held and he told the, Corinth, or the Philippians, with all that I am, I'm forgetting what's behind me and I'm straining forward with Jesus. It's not always easy. But who wants to really have an easy peasy life and they don't get to write no stories about it? You say, you want to be in the history book? No. But I want them to write it down in the book of remembrance in heaven before my God. I don't care if anybody in the world knows who I am. But Micah said that those who speak well of the Lord, he writes it down in a book of remembrance. I want my story in front of my God to say, Mason Peavy wasn't much, but he strained forward. And he went to a church of people who strained forward. And it didn't matter if they had to come twice on the weekend so that somebody could get saved at a service that needed some people in the seats. You want to be the only one in here with me hollering like this? No, we need some help with some other bodies in here. You say, do you coach like this? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I want to strain. I want to see people straining. I don't know how long I've been preaching. I don't know how long I'm going to keep preaching, Brother David. But if people are watching online, you can pause it. You guys are stuck. One time, Brother Todd and I were driving down the road, and he began to weep. And I thought, do I need to grab the wheel? What's wrong with my dad? And he looked over, and he said, man, I hope, I hope that you become so much more in the Lord than I am. And I thought, man, this is weird. <laughs> now that I have a son, I hope that I can see the day when he's a young man and things are hard. I don't want it easy on him because it, people who are easy get soft. And I don't want to be soft before God, and I don't want to be soft before the world, and I don't want him to be soft either, right? And so it's going to be hard. There's going to be days where God lets you walk through the heat a little bit. Amen. James said, don't get discouraged when your faith gets tested and you walk through various trials. Let God use it to toughen us up. And I hope that one day when I'm 50 or 60 and he's 20, and he's deciding who he's going to be, because can you imagine how the world's going to be when in 15 more, 15, 20 more years, guys? When he's going to college in some government indoctrination site, and they're telling him God ain't even real. To look over and see him start to strain forward with God when the whole world is pressing against him, when all his friends are pressing against him, when his own flesh is pressing against him. But do you honestly, you know how we learn to strain? Because God gives us witnesses. Hebrews 12 said, we are surrounded by such a great, a so great a cloud of witnesses. God sent us, he sent us examples. Ultimately, he came as the greatest example. And he strained right through the death of the cross. He said it, when he went to, uh, to go to the cross, he prayed. And he said he prayed so hard that his sweat was like drops of blood. 
He was straining way before he got to the cross, and he'll be holding me in his, his strong arm way after. And if I want to see that little boy over there strain with the Lord one day, God will show him how, right? Jesus will be faithful to him just like he's been faithful to me. But man, what kind of daddy would I be if I didn't try to show him by my example too? What kind of friend would we be to our lost high school friend that we've known for the last 25, 30 years if we didn't show them what it is to strain through God, with God through our hard times in our marriages, tough times with our kids, temptation from the world, the, the, the pulling to compromise or to not finish strong or to never get started. We got to strain. We got to be an example. And I hope, I hope victory, listen, I hope, and I know I'm preaching a long time, I hope that we are all ready to say, God, give me a chance to pull a little while longer. He said, one may fall, but there's two you can pick him up. But a threefold cord is not easily broken. Let's grab a hold of the rope together and pull and move. Because what are we moving to? The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's no greater calling. There's no greater thing but his upward call as he moves our lives to show the world who he is. There is nothing more worthwhile not our jobs, not our money, not our hobbies, not our rest, nothing. And I so badly want to be a part of a group of people who say, I will count everything else as trash. Paul says it right here in verse 7, right before this, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for Christ. What would we be if we would just be that? And we would strain forward to the upward call of our God. I was going to read a passage in Romans 8. And I'll tell you what, I'll just read it. Paul said this, and I'm be done. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Listen, you say, Man, that sounds scary. Listen. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am persuaded. Why should we strain forward with God? Why should we count everything else as worthless as we forget it and we move to his upward call? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's count the cost. And forget it and strain forward with God. We got lost kids, friends, family, strangers on the internet or wherever that need to know the call of reconciliation that we talked about last week before Jesus. They need to know. Let's push forward so that we can show them. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you say, man, you have not... Talk to lost people very much. I know. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He's calling to you and He's pressing your heart, let you know that you are separated, like I talked about a long time ago, separated from Him in your sin, and He's a holy God. But He died on the cross to pay for our sin. And He rose from the grave to give us life. And as He presses your spirit and He makes it known, that he's real and that he did do those things for you. If you will call out to him in faith, if you will call out to him in repentance, willing to turn from who you've been and follow him, he says, oh, your sins be red like scarlet. I'll make them white as wool. He wants to clean us. He wants to wash us. He wants us to make us a new creation in him. And guys, what Paul just said, nothing can separate us from his love. 
and we should then push forward with him. So I'd like everybody in here to bow your head, close your eyes. John's going to come and play. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or when I was just talking about it, or this whole time God's been stirring your heart, if you need to ask him to be your Lord and Savior and you're in this room right now, I'd like you to raise your hand. If you're listening online, Pastor Victor's about to be on the screen and he's going to talk to you about what it means to be saved and what you can do to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. It won't change you for repeating after him, repeating after me. The confession from your heart to Almighty God will be what God listens to and what he uses to meet with you and wash you from your sin. And if you need to do that, I would encourage you to listen to what he's about to tell you. But for those of us in this room, did we live up to what we preached last week? Or had we not yet really laid a hold of what Jesus made our own, what Jesus has laid a hold of for us? And if not, will we do it this week? Will we strain through the heartache? Will we strain, strain through the bitterness? Will we strain through the betrayals? Will we strain through the hard times? Will we forget the things behind us? And will we push forward to the upward call of God that he has for us to be different in this world, to be salt and light in this world, to live uncompromised and strong in the face of great temptation and sin? Will we really be the church of the Almighty God? Will we love the way he loved? And will we preach the way he preached? And will we live the way he lived so that ultimately we can glorify our master until we see him face to face? If you're here and you know you're saved, will you pray about that right now? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you and I thank you for everybody in this room, everybody that was listening online. Lord, I ask that you would open your word to us, Lord, that you would make it real to us. Lord, that we, would, that we would recognize that we have to forget the things that are behind us and we have to lay a claim to what you have given us. Lord, our faith is not passive, it's active, it's aggressive. Lord, your words in this chapter to us are pointed. And you expect us to do something with them, Lord. I pray we would strain forward. We would reach forward with all that we have. Now we would grab a hold of your outstretched hand. And we would never let you go, Lord, like Jacob said. We won't let you go. And Lord, I pray you would be bigger to us than you've ever been, that your call would be more urgent to us than it's ever been. And Lord, we would count you more worthy than we ever have. Lord, I pray that these wouldn't just be empty words that I preach and that we listen to, but they would be a call to move with you and that we would see ourselves move through things that we've been bound by for years. Or we would see us move into where you have us in your perfect will. Lord, I don't just want to be up here being a performer. I don't want to be up here being a hypocrite and preach a word and not do it. Lord, I want to be a faithful follower of you. Lord, like Paul said, I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I want to claim the things that you have for me to claim. And I want to sacrifice when you call for it. I want to be dedicated and loyal to who you are, Lord, because I want to be able to press forward so that you would receive all the honor and glory that you are truly deserving of from my life. Lord, if the day ahead is hard, I pray you would give me the strength to hold the plow. But Lord, I pray you would not let me back up lest I bring dishonor to your name. Lord, like Psalms 114 said, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to you be all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to stand with Brother John and sing, you, you can. If you want to pray at this time. Hey, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, but before I let you go, uh, and you go on with your, with your Saturday night, you know, this is one of the, Pastor Mason just preaching one of my favorite verses from the Bible, and it, just simply talks about your life, my life, right? And, and for me personally, you know, it's always really, really easy for me to look back and how great life was or look into the past and, you know, the good experiences, the bad experiences, you know, and, and sometimes I catch myself living in that. 
But my prayer for you tonight is, is and, for, and for me personally, is to press forward and to move forward. Last week I mentioned that it's, it's so, sometimes it's so easy to, you know, say that today uh, I'm going to be better, right? But that's a decision that you have to make. And, and as, as, you, as you go on tonight, my prayer would be that, that you press forward. And, and, like, and like Mason was saying, you know, it's, it's about dedication. It's about loyalty. So a couple of things here before I let you go. Number one, if in a second uh, we're, I'm going to make a prayer. And, and, and my prayer will be that, that, that you make that with me. If, like I said at the beginning of the sermon, you, you or the service, if it was your first time here, and you were you just saw us sing to a God that probably you didn't know. But after this service, you came to find out who He is and how good He is, and and that His goodness is is it, and His His presence is is all that we need. It's all that really satisfied. But tonight, before I let you go, I, I do want to let you let you know that He is good. And so, if you decided to make to welcome into your heart, I want to congratulate you. And if you're a Christian and then you're at really a uh, regular church goer and then you're just not able to attend because of, of COVID and, and the, the current situation or whatever situation that you may be facing at home, uh, I, I, I pray that you press forward. Regardless of where you're at when you walk with Christ, that you tonight can, can be a point where you're like, you know, God, I don't want to live with what was in the past, but I do want to press to what's in, 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 the, in, the, in the future. And, and more importantly, I want to live with you. It's about now. It's about looking forward. So uh, if, if today is your first time and, and you did, are deciding to dedicate your life to Jesus, uh, please repeat this prayer with me. And then just simply say, Jesus, I welcome you into my heart. Jesus, I am done trying to live a life that it's, it's full of emptiness. And God, I, I ask that you be my Lord and my Savior. I ask forgiveness of my sins, and God, and I, and I, I, I confess that, that, that you are all I need and, and all that I want to live for. God, Jesus, come into my heart and make me whole again, knowing and understanding that only you satisfy and that only you I can move forward and press forward like Paul was mentioning and in, in, in the word that Mason preached this evening. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. And so my prayer for you guys is that you guys enjoy the rest of your Saturday, that you dedicate your life. And so a couple of things that I want to run by you before I let you go is if you made that prayer, please, please contact us. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to celebrate you. And then two, if, you, if you're not sure how to connect with our church or you need somebody to pray with you, please call us. You, you'll have the information here in a second. Uh, we're, we're here to serve you. We're here to, to be faithful to, to uh, what we believe it's our calling and it's to, to connect with you and to present you the, the, the love of Jesus Christ. So enjoy your, your Saturday. Enjoy it. Hopefully we'll see you back here tomorrow. Uh, but if nothing else, be blessed. Uh, we, we really hope that you have a really good time and you have a great time of worship. Enjoy your Saturday.